Good evening and welcome to the May 15th FL Royalston Regional School Committee meeting here at Royalston Community School. The first order of business this evening is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Just before we uh, move forward, uh, just announce to you that you are being taped this evening uh, for playback on AOTV and also for posting to our district website. The approval of minutes for April 10th. Is there a motion? I make a motion to approve the minutes submitted. Is there? Okay. Motion made and seconded. Any discussion, corrections? Seeing none, all those in favor? Oh, extensions. Yep. Uh, two seconds. Yes. Okay. Public input. Did somebody? Is there any public input on there? Not. There is not. Okay. Thank you. Student representative report. Is he here? Okay. <coughs> Moving right along. Recognition, school committee, start with Nancy. I have none for tonight, thank you. None for tonight. I just want to thank uh, Beth Craven for keeping us aware of what's going on here at the Royal Street School. Uh, also, uh, my congratulations to Shane Cleveland and the entire uh, staff down at uh, uh, the FL at ACES uh, for the great job they've been doing. The report says a lot about that uh, upcoming. Uh, the change, I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but to have a change of leadership and be able to maintain the progress that they've made with uh, some of the changes there speak very highly to, to the job. And to keep that going, you know, with a change is, is not an easy thing to do. And you deserve a lot of credit. <coughs> I uh, want to uh, recognize the uh, central office staff, the uh, superintendent, uh, business manager, manager the, uh, the, uh, all the central office staff uh, uh, who did, I think, a great job trying to uh, all the uh, school buildings uh, on um, Teacher Appreciation Day and uh, get into all the classrooms and tell the teachers and paraprofessionals how much we appreciate what they're doing with uh, kids each and every day. I have none this evening. Bill? I'd like to commend the uh, parents of the uh, seniors and uh, school community volunteers that put on such a nice <coughs> drug and alcohol uh, free prom party. Yep. All right, at this time, the school committee would like to uh, make a presentation. If we could have uh, Mr. Dale Luigi come up. thank you when I arrived here last year. Dio was one of the first people to sit down with me and really get me to understand and know the community of Athol and Royalston in a very positive and enlightening way. I also was impressed with his physical fitness. Um, after he left my meeting, he said he was doing a 250-mile bike ride, I believe is what he mm -hmm. did. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, uh, fairly close. And so I, I just want to thank him for his support of me um, and the school district in the capacity of school committee member. 
in recognition of exemplary public service as a member of the Athol Royalson Regional School Committee and appreciation of the honor which you have brought to the community as a leader for public education. Nathan spreads happiness wherever he goes. Anyone who crosses Nathan's path is welcomed with a smile and enthusiastic wave and the greeting of, hi. <laughs> Nathan has concern and compassion for his classmates. When a student is absent, he goes out of his way to let me know by bringing me to the student's empty cubby. Nathan is fun loving and kind. Like me, he loves to sing. <laughs> Working with Nathan is an absolute joy. So Nathan, this is for you. Oh, your name right here. Yeah. Inevitably, these two girls make me smile because they will do this to me. High five. 
on them every day, no matter where I am. So thank you for that. Turns out Emily went to Royalston. She said that coming in, so we some nice memories here. And Heaven I met as a fifth grader. Oh, that's Paul. <laughs> I remember one day, I'll never forget the story. Every time I hear the word, I think of this song. Heather, where did you get the name from? And she said, yeah, when I was born, my mother said I was a little piece of heaven. Uh, what a beautiful story to get a name from. So thank you for all that you did in the morning announcements, the Pledge of Allegiance, for making you smile. for his determination. School has never come easy to Jaden. Um, he's persevered through a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of challenges and struggles, and uh, we're proud of him because he's gonna be gradu graduating with his class on time. So um, he's being recognized for being the most improved student from when he was a freshman to when he graduates this coming month. So uh, it's with great pride that we recognize Jaden the one. So once again, we recognize two um, <coughs> athletes as our Scholar Athletes of the Month. I'll talk about our high school um, athlete who could not be here. She has a softball game up in Pittsburgh tonight. Uh, Lindsay LeBlanc, um, who also won it last year as a middle school student. Um, she plays three sports at the high school and has a 3.98 GPA. So Lindsay LeBlanc was our, our first recipient. Uh, representing the middle school is uh, an individual who has played three sports this year. He played football in the fall, he wrestled in the winter, and he um, did outdoor track uh, this past spring. Um, he's a student who's, who's worked hard both on the field and in the classroom with an 87.5 GPA. Our Subway Scholar Athlete of the Month for the middle school for the month of April is Riley Reed.
as we put, it's not a day, it's kind of the year, and a lot of it has to do with some of just the extras that we do with the students, and um, part of it is describing RCS in one word, and um, one thing you learned this year, and the voices are kind of soft, but we put the words on the screen too, so enjoy. learning fun. Teamwork makes the dream work. And the gates, and this is our this is our scores from spring 2019. And I see that Molly made a little uh, notation that um, it was collected early, so we could identify um, 
some areas where we still want to, before they go into that first grade mode, some um, areas that we might need to address. <coughs> this is our reading achievement, and there is, um, on the left-hand side, is our fall benchmark data, and on the right-hand side, um, and this is for reading, is our spring data. The graph at the bottom shows by grade level, grades uh, one, two, three, and four, and the uh, little uh, rhombus is marking where our projected growth was. So based on that first round, where was our projected growth? And the shaded rectangle underneath is where our students are at this point. So you can see um, we've, we've met our intended growth for the year. Our grade three team is really to be commended in reading because they have you know, made significant growth. And one of the things we know about when you're a level four school is we have to not only make growth, but we have to make up some of those deficits. Um, so kudos to, to the teachers. Um, this is our math data, same setup. Um, third grade, again, exceeded their growth a little bit. Math is, you know, it's, it's a place where we have more room for improvement. <coughs> this is our district learning walk data comparing our fall so this is a, a tool we walk through. We are measuring um, 10 different um, areas. Um, and these practices that we're looking for and we get feedback on correlate to, these are the systems we need to have in place for, to uh, enhance student learning outcomes. Um, green, so you can see the benchmark at the bottom, we have shown growth, significant growth, from our fall data in all standards um, to our spring data. Um, and our spring data was collected in March. Um, we're, pretty, we're pretty happy about that. Um, one of the things that was really nice for the teachers to hear is that the air report, when we saw where we had room for growth, um, the air report that we talk about a little bit later, they gave us the same feedback. So I think it was really validating to the teachers to think that an outside agency <coughs> is coming in and validating the work that they're doing um, with our own in-district tool. Oh, RCF. There you go. Thank you. Okay, so my my slides are going to mirror the same setup as Shannon's. You can see the dibbles. Um, we still had some struggling students um, at the beginning phase. Again, um, teachers, I think at the beginning were kind of like, why are we doing the dibbles already? But I think that since we saw the data, we were, we're able to hit them pretty hard right now for the last two months of school. So the one thing I want to explain is Dibbles deals with code base skills, um, and Gates deals with comprehension. So that's why we're using both, right. is because ultimately, in the past, we only used Dibbles, which would really give us a false sense of where kids are. So now we use both of those in tandem to really help and understand our, our students' uh, growth in both those areas. Yeah, and I think um, when I went over this with Little High Kindergarten teacher, we were happy to see you know, only 10% at the beginning because at the beginning of the year, you know, she um, she really worked hard to get the, the kids that were at the bottom out of the out of the red and into the yellow and green. Um, this is our reading achievement and growth, and I, if you quick eyeball the bottom, you could see the bias <coughs> are the projected. That's where. Um, our projected growth was, and it appears we've just about reached or exceeded um, the growth for reading in all the grades. Um, if you look at the second chart, there's lightly shaded green areas, and those are where we moved. If you look at the chart on the left, um, for grade one, beginning, they started the year with 45% at the beginning of the year, but in the second chart, there's only 10 so if you quick eyeball down the red in each from fall to spring, you'll notice we're up to 45, 19, 25, and the numbers are much smaller um, in the spring. So that, um, that is a good thing, something to be celebrated. Um, and then the same with the green. So we've moved kids out of maybe the yellow into the green, so we've ended the year with less beginners and more beatings um, in all areas across reading on the map. And here's the math. Um, again, on the right-hand side, you can see the growth from the beginning and the meters um, <coughs> on the screen. And on the very bottom, um, we've just about um, succeeded in achieving our projected growth. And I will say I've been in other districts where they've done this math testing, and 
you know, congrats to ACES too, because I really have rarely seen charts with diamonds and then the, the columns going above it. So, you know, I think um, I've been impressed with, with everything I've been seeing here in the district. So um, I think this too is good. Um, I think we did this a little early as well, but this we were able to hit students where, where we saw in the data before MCAS happened, that we were able to kind of fill in the gaps based on this data. So I think that's, oh, the walkthrough data. We, we kind of fell a little bit in some of them, but if you'll notice um, our, our second, our spring data, there were only four classrooms observed, so the percentages kind of get off, but it still gives us an area, and we've looked over the past two years that this data is kind of um, guiding the path for our school improvement plan for next year. So we're using this data, you know, as much as we like to see all green, having some of the yellow or red gives us, you know, an area to focus in for, for the um, school <coughs> Yeah, I, I do want to mention sure. from a statistical point of view, because the numbers are here so small, that one person can plummet <laughs> their numbers very quickly. So we're not sure the data system for this particular school is, is, is quite as accurate as we can see in other buildings, just because the pool is so small. So I want to make sure that's, that's said. Um, because ultimately one person could take you from 100% down to 75% of the whack. So um, it's important that people understand that. But that's why we looked over two years and, and kind of seen if we could see patterns as small as they were. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, if you come to call, it's not humbling, kind of embarrassing when Tom Austin and I presented in the winter after that shocking to us, we suspected there was something going on, and uh, the teachers impressed upon the students' importance, nominated them conference about their goals and improvement, the offers of incentives, we're going to take it very seriously, and tonight spoke to all the students about you know, really putting the time and effort to give us some authentic results. I'm happy to say there was a jump in almost every subject from winter to spring, and we caught up a little bit from what we wanted to see. Uh, so from the fall to the spring, uh, fifth, in reading, uh, achievement and growth, met its book, see it its target, still a little weak in, in sixth, uh, a new program, and a few teachers I think you know, may account for that at grade level. Seventh, met, and uh, eighth, outpaced it quite a bit. The math fifth came close, sixth, clearly a need there, and uh, working with a consultant, and uh, you know, we're working to address that need. We did do some interventions uh, after school in three grades. Uh, so I'm hoping that will help for the MCAS. Seventh met and, and eight, although well, actually see it a bit. <coughs> With the before you go on the part there, I think it's important for people to know in the consultant <coughs> one of the things they found was the curriculum we were using may not be rigorous enough in relationship to uh, the new MCAS standards. So there's been a change in the curriculum there from engage New York to open up math, and we're hoping that will help. Uh, with, with some of that. In addition to that, we will have another consultant agency coming in to actually um, review the actual instruction that's happening in the middle school, and they'll be giving us feedback there as well to see what else will need to be done, and I think that's happening at the end of March, or so May, correct, Molly? Correct, that's right. Yeah, um, so we're hoping that will help as well, so we, we're very quickly uh, looking and assessing that situation. Thank you, Garcia. We, I wish we had the green that ACES had. Uh, we don't. Well, we tried this last round in the learning walk is to have the teachers focus in three areas, particularly one and two, like I said, we should have very clearly, you know, clearly above uh, the eighty percent there in the, you know, almost every classroom, nice clear close to objectives, uh, planning, reflective, uh, meeting that. And number nine, the congregation was a strong point, but clearly there's some areas there that you know, when we focus on a few areas, there was less focus on some of the others, which Get them all in the green uh, next time around. And uh, one of the things I want to mention to the school committee, uh, based on our budget, this was one of our target areas to put a literacy academic coach into the building um, to try to help with some of this so that teachers are getting more coaching um, in those instructional strategies that make a difference for students. So next year we will have a K-8 to uh, math coach and a K-8 to literacy coach so that more time can be spent with individual teachers in the classroom, really understanding and implementing these strategies. And that was uh, discussed and talked about at length 
um, before the budget, and so that's this this just reemphasizes the need for that. Okay, so high school high school ELA. Last time we were here, we talked about the ninth graders, and so you don't actually see the winter, but winter was stagnant in ninth grade last time we were here. So we talked about um, increasing the rigor in that ninth grade in those ninth grade classes. Which we, which we had a focus on throughout that next period of time. And you can see we were able to move that, that middle group um, about nine points up into the, in the meeting area, actually 11 points up into the meeting area. So we, that, that focus did actually make, it a, make a, a positive impact. In regards to the 10th graders, our focus throughout the year is 10th graders to get them to pass the MCAS. So that's where all of our resources and all of our attention in regards to extra interventions happen. So our focus has been on those 10th graders and those interventions, and you can see how much we were able to move those students out of the beginning and progressing up into the meeting category. So uh, in the end, 94% of those students were either progressing or meeting. So I think that was where we kind of analyzed it. That was the biggest difference. Our focus was 10th grade interventions. It's something we really need to consider as we have the resources put extra interventions into the ninth grade to be able to move them that much more um, in the ninth grade year. In regards to the, the, the math at the school, at the high school, um, see that uh, we were able to move our ninth graders um, out, of the, out of the beginning more into the progressing and a little less success at the 10th grade level. I just in analyzing all of this, we kind of just want to speak to the importance of consistency in the classroom. And um, not, without getting too deep into it, there wasn't the consistency in the classroom that we needed uh, to be able to make that, make that prog progress uh, in that 10th grade class. So, you know, health and other issues come up in people's lives, so it, it does make an effect. And when we talk about being there every single day for our students, I think that speaks a lot to it right in front of us. The other thing to keep in mind, remember that this year we made a change in the curriculum at the high school, and that we went to Algebra 1A and Geometry 1A, which means they didn't get the whole full year course, they only got half of it, they'll get the second half next year to try to slow down the pace and make sure more kids are retaining. So remember this test is testing as if the kids took the whole year. So we are going to see a little different impact here. Uh, because of that. What will really tell us the story is next year when we test the 10th um, graders because they will have had the 1A and 1B and then they will go on to the, uh, you know, the, um, excuse me, they both will have the 1A and next year they'll have the, the, the 1B for geometry and algebra. So we should see some significant change, but we anticipated this would happen because we slowed the curriculum down because we saw kids coming into uh, the high school were not where they needed to be and we wanted to make sure we gave them more time. So we're very hopeful that next year we'll see uh, we'll see improvement in this area. Last bit is our, our walkthrough data. Without getting into it too much, our focus for next year is on turnaround practices in regards to instructional practices and student engagement. So indicators uh, three through nine, <coughs> we focus on those areas. That's, that's what our focus will be this summer. Um, to really try to provide support to our teachers so we can really enhance our adjustments to practice and student engagement strategies. And so one of the things we will be doing um, this year is we will be adding, what we've been able to do is internally through scheduling, cut down the number of classes a one teacher is teaching in the building to try to give more instructional help in the classroom for next year at the high school. And in addition to that, through our Title IIA money, we are putting in to hire a part-time uh, math coach at the high school. So there will be no additional money needed from our project. It comes from the grant fund. But we believe that also will help because one of the things we're realizing is some of it is, is really understanding conceptual development of mathematics and being able to instruct in that way. And some of our teachers are struggling. So we really need somebody who really deeply understands the math and can work with them on a week to week basis. basis. So we, are, we will be putting that in next year, which will hopefully help uh, moving forward as well. And I do want to recognize the fact that the high school did make some shifts last year in their scores, but up. we're hoping it will again. Um, Black Rome isn't built in a day, uh, but they are, they are making the strides to see that happen. New business. Cascade University, now move donation. 
So also, we just want to recognize them. They, um, as you know, we've got a uh, piano donated to the school, but the problem was how to get the piano from the house to the building. And so cast iron movers, uh, uh, normally would have decided $700 for that to happen. They actually donated their services, so I just want to recognize them tonight for their support in getting the piano over to us. Okay, next. Uh, you do have a copy of the retainer agreement uh, between the district and the Dupre law offices. Just to uh, summarize for those that will be watching the tape later on, uh, this agreement is between the district and Fred Dupre's law office. Uh, who, he would represent the school system as general counsel, labor relations counsel, and spend counsel. And uh, his retainer is $4,000 a month, and, and the agreement covers day-to-day uh, -day advice, legal opinions, contract administration, contract negotiations, et cetera. So we do need to have a motion um, to move ahead with this. This would be for uh, the period of July 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2020. Is there a motion? I make the motion, we approve. A second. Just a second. Okay. <laughs> Discussion. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, uh, our attorney for uh, his always uh, professional uh, work. Uh, always available when needed. And uh, I think he does a great job for us and uh, eager to uh, to look at this conference. Okay. Okay. Anything further? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Thank you. We're looking forward to working for you at the end. Right, I have a copy of this one. Well, two actually. One from my office and one from the school. Okay, next we have. And I'm going to go over that. Uh, do you have a copy of the curriculum review guide in your packet? This is a guide for our district to have a more sustainable process um, for how we're reviewing and adopting curriculum moving forward. So we have a curriculum review team that meets every, uh, every other week, and that team has been working on this <coughs> guide and formally um, approved and adopted this in February. And what this does is it outlines what our district's goals are and um, procedures and practices around the development and the revision of curriculum. It outlines a four-step cycle for how to go through and have teams review that curriculum in a more systematic and outlined fashion, um, including components at each stages of that cycle. And in addition to that, what you'll see in here is a schedule or timeline for which subjects we'll be reviewing in which part of that cycle for the next, I believe it's a five-year cycle. Six-year cycle, excuse me. No, five, thank you. A uh, five-year cycle. Um, so are there any questions regarding that? Mitch. Yeah, just a comment that I, I very much appreciate uh, that uh, the work that you've done here. I know there were a number of us lobbying for this for any number of years to have a, a, a regular curriculum cycle with, with specific timelines. And I think that's a real accomplishment uh, for this uh, administration. Thank you. The step towards us having that accountability system in place for us, as well as structures and systems to keep it systematic for us as well. For our I agree very much with Mitch. This is comprehensive and very, very good. Thank you. Uh, RCS SFP presentation. Okay, I'm in it. Uh, a look back at last year's report on um, school improvement plan. We're working towards next year's based on the data, but I just am going to give you an update on how we did this year. Plan that would be implemented in both ELA and math. 
So at the very beginning of the year, we didn't have the official state report of the lowest um, performing students. So we kind of went um, by identifying based on the fall map, and then we cross-referenced it when the list came out from the state. Um, at monthly data meetings um, with teachers, we kind of monitored, kept a, not, a close eye on all of these lowest performers, and um, with those, that, the data meetings are with myself and individual teachers. And at regular faculty meetings, we just kind of went over and remember these are the lowest performers, keep an extra eye out on them. Um, inter intervention plans were set up. Our Title I teacher, Vivian, is kind of like a, a surgeon when she goes in to kind of diagnose issues with reading and, and whatnot. So she met with the regular ed teachers. Um, these students were monitored through Wonders Assessment, Title I assessments, and math testing. The results show that 11, 8 out of the 11 lowest performers, so 73% met their projected growth on MAP, um, ELA and MAP. And two of the three that did not meet, we cross-referenced it um, with their attendance records, and we noticed that um, there were some of the ones that are, if not chronically absent, are bordering right about 10%, which um, is considered chronically absent. So, um, our second um, strategic objective was to increase the overall ELA and CAS and MAP scores through implementation of literacy, literacy strategies across all curriculums. So again, we kind of did this at the beginning of the year when I didn't know much about um, the school, the staff, the district. So um, I looked at the MCAS scores. A lot of them were hovering right around 493 to 95. So we kind of just said, let's, let's push it to 500. Um, but we saw implementation of keys to literacy strategies in all grade levels, all subject areas, including the speech teacher. Um, I observed doing a top-down web. The, phys the physical education teacher had me come in and actually did a top-down web there. Um, we are all seeing top-down webs everywhere in our lives now because once you learn it, you just kind of see them everywhere. Um, but those were the two uh, the most commonly used strategies were top-down webs and two-column notes. Um, key ideas and details showed the mo most growth in literacy as opposed to um, um, informational reading. That's what that should say. 71% um, of all students scored meeting expectations on the um, spring ELA map. And um, this was just kind of a little uh, data dive that we did into informational text versus literary text. So you could see that the literary text, we did a really good job in growing on the key ideas and details. The last column all the way down shows we grew 21 points, but on the informational text, only six points. So I think um, our teachers on whole are really good at, you know, um, diving into literature. So um, this will kind of point the direction to work a little bit more on informational text for next year. Um, ensure alignment of grades three to five science curriculum um, to the mass next generation science standards. I'm a former science teacher, so I thought that um, looking at what we had and um, the transition to NGSS, uh, we didn't have much, but this year grade five <coughs> is fully aligned. Um, there's going to be a volunteer elementary science committee forming. We plan to meet at least once before summer and maybe throughout summer. Um, grades three and four will begin to align this summer. All grades three through five have new curriculum and materials. Um, Darcy okay the order to, uh, to go in, to go in uh, all in with three to five. Um, so that's exciting. And my goal is to be fully aligned by opening day, to use baseball terms, I guess. <laughs> Oh, that STEM scopes is also what they're using at the middle school. So grades six, seven, and eight as well. So it'll be a nice kind of through line um, to the middle school. Strategic objective number four was to decrease chronic absenteeism, which is 18 days or more, or 10%. Our state target last year was 7.5% of students. Unfortunately, <coughs> we were at 19%. Um, last year of students that were considered chronically absent. So what we did is we had bi-weekly meetings of the attendance committee, which consisted of our school nurse, um, myself, and the guidance counselor. We tracked last year's attendance. Those kids that um, popped up as being chronically absent last year and right from day one, um, we started tracking. We had them in a separate group to kind of keep an eye on their attendance. Um, then we tracked patterns of absenteeism for this year. 
We send home letters encouraging attendance with fact sheets when students reach X amount of days or are getting closer to the 10% um, of days absent. But we also congratulated that that's what's there. Certificates, those who improved attendance percentage over time. So that if they were at 10% and they moved down to 8%, we kind of sent home a congratulations and thank you. And a sixth grade student went home and was just so happy that he got it and put it on the refrigerator. So those little things, I think, kind of help. Um, currently, there's only 4% of our students considered uh, chronically absent. So that's five students. Three of them actually have medical um, issues. So I think we're doing pretty good on that on that front. Are there any questions? Moving forward. <laughs> Solidify the silence curriculum in grades three and four. Um, our goal with the uh, instructional leadership team, we're already talking about it, is to better follow the process for multi-tiered systems of support for academics and behavior um, and attendance actually on there and better use of data to drive specific actionable, actionable classroom observations and feedback for teachers. So just making our observations more kind of specific about what we're looking for and using that data. Do you have any questions? Charlie. Yes. Uh, could you define top-down web? Yes, top-down webs are amazing. These uh, wonderful, oh, they're all over. <laughs> so when the students read a text, they put the main idea at the top, and then they put on the next level, um, like subtopics, and then they go down from there. So they're learning kind of the, organ, uh, the organization and structure of pieces of writing, and you can use them in every single subject. Um, and it's, it's kind of amazing, and kids take to it, and um, when all the teachers are using it in math and social studies and science, they're kind of connecting that we read in reading, but we also read in math, and we also read in science, and we also read in social studies, and you really attack a piece of writing the same way. Yeah. And you take those two column, I mean, you take the webs, and then those can be put into two column notes, and from there we generate questions and um, go from there. Does that make sense, yeah? Yeah, just something else I wanted to say. I'm, I'm just blown away by your success in reducing chronic absenteeism. You know, I, I never knew that, that much improvement would have been possible, which means there were things we were never doing before. Right, right. And I don't think we were until, you know, we looked at the data across the system and uh, we said, well, what are we doing about this? And there was no real system in place. So I think um, I think it was good. At the beginning, we were like, how are we going to do this? You know, and I think, and kids, when you talk to them, hey, I'm glad you're here today. And the teachers are really good at saying, Glad you show up for school today. Good job. Because I think sometimes, you know, if nobody misses them, they, they tend to not want to come, you know. So I think uh, we'll keep working on that. I'm hoping to keep it at four, right? Um, the, the one thing I do want to say for all the principals, um, remember, a data decision-making process in this district didn't really exist prior to to this year, and the, the principals have really taken to it. Um, as you can see, the are <coughs> just looking at the layout, well, this many kids are efficient. They're actually digging down in and figuring out, for example, she talked about informational text um, versus literature and how we're doing so we can really get focused and targeted. And that's why you're seeing that improvement. So I want to give a lot of credit to the principals because um, we've thrown a lot at them in a very short period of time and they have been troopers in understanding it and moving forward with it and also keeping their teachers on board and their willingness to try it. So I really want to say thank you uh, to them for that. Uh, I wanted to take this opportunity. I wanted to say it early, we moved on too quickly, but I was, again, impressed by the principal's, principal's presentation of the uh, data from their individual schools. And I know that uh, because of the fact that our district and the principals and Central Office administrators are, are getting to be so good at, at uh, using the data. We sometimes forget how far we've come. But I think it's, it's great that they're able to see areas of improvement. And they're also able to focus on areas that haven't seen improvement, or in fact, have even gone backward into this, uh, deciding, really, OK, what are we going to do about this going forward? So uh, again, it's a, it's a very professional kind of, uh, of school system that we have now that relies on, on data. We did a lot of talking, Darcy, about data in the past. We did a little bit of dabbling with data here and there in terms of a, a fully organized system where everybody was on the same page. 
uh, and using data religiously, I think that's, uh, that's what's so different in this year and last year. Okay, case is airy here. So we had our air um, report come back, which is feedback. So some of you may, may know, but I'll just refresh your memory if you are not aware. As part of our turnaround plan, one of our requirements is that we get an outside consultant contracted through DESI, and that is um, American Institute for Research. Um, and they come out and they do a very comprehensive um, study and they give you feedback on here's where you are, this is where you need to go, but here's where you are with that outside lens. It's pretty comprehensive. It is um, two days where they are in, I think they were in just about every classroom in our building. Um, they send a survey to all of the staff. They have <coughs> focus group meetings with staff. They have in-depth interviews with all of the school leaders, curriculum directors, academic coaches. Um, some teachers are pulled out for individual long, long interviews. Um, and then they write a report where they give you a lot of progress, a lot of feedback about where you are in your turnaround practice. It can be a little nerve-wracking. This was my first time doing this, and when they sent it, I was like, holy moly. Um, so we get that report back and it comes in two sections. One is feedback about classroom data and one is feedback about your, um, all the written narrative stuff and then they kind of combine it and say this is where you stand. So what we've identified is that we have um, of those four turnaround practices, we have a really, um, we're very strong in our school climate and culture. Um, that we got some really good feedback from our state systems of support because they were encouraging and telling us that you have to be really strong there to move the instructional piece. So if that's a weakness, you have to do, you have to spend your attention on that first. So if that was a strength, um, was a real real boost to um, what we were feeling when we saw the walkthrough data and validated some of the things we're seeing on the walkthrough data that. This is, this is what an outside agency is also finding. Can you um, hold on a second, Shannon? Sure. Shannon's being humble. She got sustaining, which is the highest in Canada. So I want to make sure people hear that. She's being very humble, but you know, there are several levels to this, and she received, her school received the highest category in this area. So I want to make sure people are aware of that. Well, there were a lot of pieces in place before I got there, so I'm, I'm not going to take uh, too much credit. But um, we're really happy to see that. I think the teachers felt you know, a little bit empowered, and certainly the admin team did. Um, we also have a strength in classroom organization, um, practices around productivity, our rituals and routines, uh, which means we're not losing a lot of instructional time in transition, um, dealing with behavior management. So when our kids are in school, for the most part, they're, they're working. Um, and our instructional learning formats, we have a lot of systems in place. Um, so, oh, I think these got out of order. <laughs> so the four performance areas are limited evidence, um, which we don't want to have at all because that means it's like you're not even doing it. Um, developing, which means there's systems in place, but those systems haven't become consistent practices yet. So it's pretty clear what we're supposed to be doing, but it's not consistent. Providing means that um, it's pretty uniform across the school, there might be little tweaks, um, and one of the, when I was reading the report said communication, so that was a little tweak we need to do to get it at our highest level, but that pretty consistent, that practice is in place, and then sustaining, which means this is working well for them. So this is the breakdown of all that stuff. This is where we fall. So in turnaround practice one, leadership shared responsibility and professional collaboration, we are at providing. So it means we've done a bulk of the work. We should feel pretty good about that, but there's a little room for improvement, some tweaks that we can push ourselves into sustaining. Intentional practices for improving instruction, also providing. Turnaround practice three, this is where the bulk of our work now needs to be. Um, Student-specific supports and instructions for all students. 
This is the focus of our turnaround plan. We've been talking about this with our ILT team, looking at this is where we are. That's where our next year's plans are going to focus because the data says that's our weakest area. And then school climate and culture is that sustaining. So next steps. We've already done some of these steps. Um, we reviewed the data with our state system of support team. Um, and we kind of unpacked it and, and they gave us some feedback about how to, how to prioritize and strategize. Um, review with our ILT team, we've already started to do that. Our instructional leadership team has started to really give some feedback. Um, and that's really important to get the staff by, um, that they have a voice. We are currently working on developing our plan for next year. Um, and some of our target areas will be that we're going to review and modify our intervention block, which when we look at our weakest area, those student-specific supports, it makes sense. That will be, you know, looking at how are we effectively meeting the needs of our diverse student population. Um, work with our Title I and special education staff to meet those needs. Um, and PD on differentiation and rigor as focus areas for next year. We had a, a PD staff meeting this afternoon where we started talking with staff about this is what the focus for next year is going to look like so we can start laying that groundwork and that they can you know, be prepared for what's coming as our focus area for next year. I just wanted to say a couple of things. Uh, having served in the past on state school studies and uh, going into a school, and there are things that we were looking for, obviously, much like what the state is looking for now. Uh, you have some things foundationally in place that I've seen in other schools not happen at all, and they were lost, and they were in trouble. Uh, it's very encouraging to see how strong the foundational things are in the school you mentioned. Uh, it's also encouraging to see how teachers have moved over this course of time into more elaborate practice and, and more involved practice. And the fact that you get it, which is really the bottom line when these when these teams go into schools, if the, if the administration doesn't get it, and they're not interacting correctly with the faculty and the staff, and they're not all moving in the same direction as the team, they're not going to get it. This is obviously kind of a, a record of the fact that it is happening, and you're doing a very good job. Thank you. Hey, Carla and Mitch. Um, I just, I want to say, I when I got this out of the packet, I pulled out the similar report that was produced at this time in 2017 mm -hmm. and, and just checked how we had done over time. And there were many more places where we had improved, where we had gotten a higher rating than there were places where we had a lower rating. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the lower rating ones was didn't make any sense. And I think there was one where they changed the criteria completely. Um, but it just shows it's an indication of the real progress your school and the system is making because of this relentless focus on improvement. I think when we look at our, our data, we disaggregate it, and we're trying to give a brief overview, but they rank in each practice, the 20, they saw 22 classrooms. And we've noticed even sometimes where we might have had one classroom that, like Darcy had said, kind of an outlier, and they lower the overall, we saw a lot of movement where most of our classrooms are in the highest performing range. So there's a lot when you look at that report that you can't see from a raw number, um, but that shows that some of that, those trends are going in the right direction. Mitch. Yeah, a few things. Uh, one is, uh, again, the report is uh, for the most part glowing. And I want to congratulate you on that. And I want to congratulate uh, Julie and Amy on that. I want to congratulate Molly on that. Superintendent on that. Uh, it's, it's really a, a teamwork approach that has uh, that has manifested itself in some really great scores. Uh, the question I'm going to ask is, you know, I went through this and I tried to use my two highlighters, yellow and, and red, and I use the, the uh, yellow one for all the good things that I saw. And if you would see this, you'd see that it's, it's just filled with yellow. But I use the pink one every time there was a concern. Sure. Uh, and. I, as, as I said, I'm actually asking you to, to confirm what I suspect, and that is, when I go through this, I say, all right, what do they point out 
as the areas of concern. And I'm not going to uh, elaborate on those very much, but as an example, it says common concerns about level of trust between staff and their instructional supports, and uh, uh, not being able to get uh, to all the classes that the staff member needed to get to during the intervention period, uh, developing uh, trust uh, between various uh, groups, uh, opportunities for gifted and talented, not necessarily offered to everybody, those kinds of things. And there are a few other areas. Do you do as I've done, which is uh, Darcy and I sat and, and, we, and we looked with the SOS team, and so th there's room for growth, there's no doubt. We're a level four school, so our, our kids that are gifted and talented, um, do we need to offer more than that? That's a fair enough critique. Absolutely. So you do ex exactly what I'm often sure. I'm praising darts for doing. You pinpoint the areas of concern and say, okay, how do we deal with this going right. forward? Right. And I think a lot of those things you just spoke about are going to directly fall when we said we need to have student-specific supports. So that student-specific support might not just be our struggling student. What do we do to our really gifted student who's sitting in there? That's a student specific support also. So I think all those things you highlighted fall under that area that's our weakest. Um, so there's there's work to do. Um, those are certainly the areas where we have to have to do better. Um, and that use of instructional coaching, I think that's something that is a relatively new position and trust can is built over time and experience. Okay, and I want to end with the, uh, the positive. One of the things that was most impressive about this report is their quotations from either school leaders or, or even more so from <coughs> teachers who are not necessarily school leaders. Mm -hmm. So when someone uh, says that about the feedback that you get back, that it was specific and useful, that gives immediate feedback, the little tags say what they saw, what our strengths are, what we could possibly think of, like questions moving forward, that's been uh, really helpful. Those kinds of uh, comments, I think, really enable us to, uh, to see what's happening in that school. And what I saw in here really, uh, reflected very well on you and also reflected very well on the, the few times I've been in as part of the, the, the walkthroughs. Mm -hmm. And those are exactly the kinds of things that I, that, that I see that they're talking about in here. So I think it's a, it's a very descriptive and very accurate report of what's happening. And for the most part, it's extraordinarily positive. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> That's a good note to set down. <laughs> uh, I just want to note on that report, you should know, this is still in draft. Um, Chin has a chance to write back there are any areas where they felt they got it wrong and uh, give specific feedback on that. So the final report you will get, I doubt there will be many changes to the document, but you may see one or two once that happens, but I thought it was important to uh, at least begin the conversation with this group. The changes will be minor, if anything. Okay. Uh, we do have, under communications, you have your uh, usual enrollment information. Um, so I just want to note to the school committee again, one of the things we're looking at, if you take a look at the um, um, Athol Elementary uh, Community uh, School, that in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and third grade, we have five classes. Uh, if we roll this up for next year, we have a dilemma in fourth grade um, in that, uh, you know, the class size is moving over. Uh, as you can see, we're in, we're in the 20s in, in, in every area. There really isn't a place to move. So we may have to consider putting in an additional fourth grade teacher um, as we move forward. Pre-K is really not a good predictor because remember, not everybody goes into preschool. So um, we don't want to say we're only looking, because if we're looking at the numbers that are in preschool now, rolling into kindergarten, it looks like we could go and, you know, eliminate a class, but that's not the case because we still have to be, it will be kids coming in who have never come to our preschool. And uh, last year, as you can see, we had a large number coming in. The other thing that's positive is the overall number in the district has gone up um, almost, uh, I think it's 60 students uh, this year. And um, as you can see, our smallest class is graduating from the high school this year. If our trend remains, we're going to continue to go up. And I want to say that we are one of the few districts in the Franklin and Worcester County that is actually going up and not down. Um, I was at a meeting with the Franklin County superintendents, and they were all talking about losing students. And I said, we have the opposite problem. Um, so we're very excited about that. I think that's also an indicator as to the quality uh, of the education students are starting to get in our world stands so
Um, I, I'm looking at the uh, class sizes in grade one, grade, grade two next year, mm -hmm. um, which is really pushing the top of the, uh, the level of the class size we wanted. Yeah. Have we thought about the possibility of adding another class for grade three? Two. Um, two. Yeah, we could, but money's going to become an issue. Um, yeah. I think we have a contingency plan for one. We don't necessarily have a contingency plan yeah. for two. Um, so we're really going to have to think about what does that look like. And one of the places we could potentially look is the high school. But if you take away a position at the high school, what you're eliminating is, is, is some choice for the kids. And so that's the worry. Because if you look at the high school right now, our average class size is uh, 14 or less. Um, so that's a possibility. But again, the problem with high schools is the less teachers you have, the more difficult it is to offer choice for kids. Um, but uh, it is something we can potentially look at. Uh, Ken, uh, since we're talking about enrollment, do we have figures on how many students we have at Monty Tech? At Monty Tech, I believe we can only, our school, we fill all our slots, and I believe it's 30 or 35 days? It was 26. I think we had, I think it was 26. 26? 18 of them right now, out of the middle school. I believe was the number that I was told by guidance today. Today that are going over to Monty Tech. But I think we have, we are allowed to <coughs> have 30 slots. And usually we fill them, but it sounds like it might be less next year than in the previous years. Yeah, there's been some kids that have already said that even though they've got in, they're not going, but they'll just go down to the next group of kids. So we'd be looking at about 90 that's what we're projecting. Yes. Okay. Uh, under financial statements and approval of accounts, to date expenditure report. Okay, we okay, you know, pull out your expenditure report. Um, and, uh, not a lot, I mean, not a lot of uh, uh, activity that I can really point to. It's out of the uh, unusual. Um, we're still at, when we look at page three, we still have the three long-term subs right now in the district. I know, I think we've got two more to add to that just for the, the very end of the, of the year here as we're um, changing some staff and some st uh, staff are retiring. Um, our substitute line on page four, Right now, through the first payroll in May, it's still at, at 49, actually, which is not bad. Um, but I think what we've learned in the past is, is May and June sometimes takes a dive in that, uh, in that account. So hopefully that'll, that'll be positive. Um, it's, it's, um, it seems to be an average of about fifteen or $16,000 a month. So if we say that, and May and June is $15,000, thousand dollars that would be thirty that would leave us you know some fun with it. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, on page five under um, instructional uh, materials halfway down you see arms in high school. I think Beth was talking about the, the science materials. We um, the middle school science materials are in. I know they're being checked in. We're paying uh, we're paying invoices now and the high school science materials have just been ordered. So um, both uh, uh, big, big amounts of uh, budget are going through those materials, and hopefully they will uh, get to good, be in good use in both the high school and middle school next year. I know they will be. So we did, we were able to squeeze those both into this budget, this year's budget. So that, that's a good thing. And being that said, we did freeze the, um, you know, the general supplies, uh, the, the general supplies, which is right now is fourteen thousand dollars to help pay for that. So we'll get those invoices in, and your next report will reflect. Um, we reflect both those orders being paid. Um, let's see, transportation services on page seven at the very top, we're still keeping an eye on that. As, as we explained last time, we, we had some uh, you know, unanticipated um, transportation issues that we had to deal with. We had, when, when, you, when, you trans, when, you were, when we're mandated to transport, we're mandated to transport. So when somebody moves in or out and we have to transport them, it sort of takes you a, uh, Sort of blindside you sometimes with that transportation. So we'll have to keep that in mind as we're closing out. I can't believe we're halfway through May already. Um, 
And then a um, couple other um, issues on page eight, we've all been tracking the RCS water, and that budget has gone over you know, $14,500 so far. But you know, uh, right now, Bob is working with the contractor to get that chemical system in um, to take care of the, uh, uh, the chemical issues they're having with the water. So hopefully next year's budget uh, will, be, will be online. But this was uh, unanticipated. And then I think on the very last page, um, I want to bring your attention to the principal of the high school ARP project. There's a seventy-five thousand dollar note there. And uh, Lee does have the um, the note paperwork tonight that, um, as chair, he'll need to sign. And um, that's a long-term note for the high school project that will become due in June. So that seventy-five thousand dollars will basically go away once that note becomes due. The nine seventy-eight at the bottom is tr is tracking well. Um, you know, again, in May and June, we, we get a little blindsided with some invoices uh, that come in that we either didn't encumber or that have been late. Um, but if, if, we, if we close the way I think we're going to close, we should see um, E&D at, at maybe about $450,000, which is good. We were figuring about four hundred, dollars so I think it might be four fifty, dollars which is, which is a good thing. I mean, it's not huge, but it's better than what we expected, and that's all we're going to so expenditures uh, are looking good and are tracking good. Um, but I do want you to know that we didn't stop letting you spend money on anything about <laughs> a comprehensive understanding. to the ground. <laughs> 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 the revenues as well, uh, they're, they're coming in good. Uh, I think, again, we'll be on target for, for the revenues, um, which will keep us on target for e and as well. Next, sir. Could you tell me where we utilize crossing guards or how many crossing guards are where are utilized in the district this year? Uh, right, I, I think um, probably Shannon could, could talk more about it, but we do have a crossing guard. We get we two, two, two crossing guards, yeah, right. Are those at, at the school or is still one at Pleasant Street? One up near the Pleasant, old Pleasant Street building and then <coughs> one further down um, near, close to our building. And will those be impacted at all? by the sidewalk construction that's currently going on? Ultimately, uh, I'll speak to that. Ultimately, I told the lady that we may have to put the one at the Pleasant Street School back in if the sidewalk is is, is, is finished. Because right now, we did not have the number of kids coming down the street. It was about six total. Um, so we couldn't validate continuing that position. However, with the sidewalk going in, we may see a much larger crowd coming up. Um, so we've, we've kind of set that aside, saying that we're in a situation where we're at. The other one up at the school, I don't see us replacing. Um, and the reason for that is ultimately now the two administrators were hoping that one could be outside to replace that because before we did only have one, one assistant principal. Now having an assistant principal and early childhood director, we, we may not need that additional audit. Thank you. Uh, Chuck. I believe you're going to jump Sorry. Um, with the new sidewalk on Pleasant Street, will there be a need to have a crossing guard right there in front of uh, Kessler's house on Pleasant Street, where they, where they'll, they'll be crossing Pleasant Street? That right, that's, where the, that's where the shift will happen. We still use the same individual, we just have to move right Yeah. Yes, 
There's a town bylaw and a town of Athol. But it's 48 hours, right? That places that responsibility on two homeowners. 48 hours doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> it always has been. But doesn't the town, uh, doesn't the, so what am I seeing here? Doesn't the town bylaw say that Street? Because most, of, most likely that stretch of Hathaway Street, that property is probably town owned. Just, just as a side note, uh, because this comes up quite frequently, and trust me, I'm not too sure how I would, how receptive the natives of Athol would be if we said we're going to plow Pleasant Street sidewalks and don't plow anybody else. <laughs> but um, oh, the, the device that is used for municipalities to do that the proper way is $185,000 for so that one. So it's a matter of trying to find that into capital planning eventually. But the other thing is that the school district PFA uh, bid amendment, and then do you want to explain what that is, or I can, whatever you want. Uh, yep, um, because the, um, the high school ARP project, the roof and the boiler, which, is, which have already been done, because those, well, actually because of the three bids, because now we've got our, also our windows and our doors that have been done also. Because those three bids have, are done, and the bids came under $1.8 million, Think about what we're going to do with that you know, excess book. That 1.8, um, are we going to take it out of the budget or are we going to put it in the contingency? Our OPM strongly suggests that we put it in the contingency. And I think uh, Fred was of, of the same mindset. We just transfer that uh, that that bid statement to the contingency. Then during the rest of the project, we still got the windows and doors going in in July and August. If something else happens or you know some un unanticipated. Uh, Expense comes along, you got that in, in the budget. So in order to do that, MSBA requires us to do this what's called PFA bid amendment to transfer uh, uh, the funds out of the general construction into contingency plan. That's what they do. And just so everybody understands, um, because believe me, I've looked into this and tried to stretch it five different ways to put it on a track, but <laughs> that budget money, uh, that money is project money that is borrowed specifically and is contained in the F MSBA project. It's not available funds, so at the end of the day, if we end at $1.8 million under budget, that's not cash in the bank that we can spend. That's just borrowing capacity, so that would go away. Uh, we do have a motion uh, that somebody needs to make, I'll read it. Uh, it's uh, to maintain the total budget project of the PFA amendment for the Apple High School project and the bid savings of $1,826,011 reallocated to the construction contingency and therefore ineligible for reimbursement for section 2.3 of the PFA. Moved by Ken, is there a second? Second. Second by Mitch. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? <coughs> Opposed? Mentions? Okay. Uh, is there anything for strategic plans? Uh, yes, uh, one other thing. Oh, oh yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot all that. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, we do have, and, and this just came to light before um, before the agenda was made, before I, uh, um, before the final warrant was done. We um, discovered the high school discovered that they had two thousand eighteen dollars and ninety four cents worth of a hospital tutoring bills to a company called Learn Well. Learn well, yes. 
that actually were sent to us at the end of last year. And if we think what happened is they were emailed to um, the previous principal's email, and they were stuck in there. And we'll be, you know, obviously looking at that. So um, they came to light today, and so I do have for vote, if, if you would, vote fiscal 18 bills for the hospital tutoring to pay Learn Well $2,018.94 to finish up last year's uh, bills that seem to have been stuck in somebody's email. Mitch, I move we pay Learn Well, but we don't have. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Strategic plan update. Um, all of it was uh, covered under uh, unfinished business new business. So okay. uh, reports of the chair this evening, just to bring to your, I, everybody should have received uh, an email containing all the upcoming uh, graduation activities for Athol High School. And just, I'm not sure if this was included or not, but I did receive this today, so I wanted to just uh, announce that the school committee on Wednesday, June 5th, 2019 at 2.30, at Athol High School Auditorium, uh, you're invited to the Athol High School Alternative Program graduation. That is, uh, again, the date is Wednesday, June 5th at 2.30 at the high school. Okay, budget, finance, uh, that committee has not met. They will be, uh, but obviously our budget, they probably would be again towards the end of the fiscal year. Um, our budget has been set, approved, uh, will be approved at the upcoming June town meeting. Facilities, Ken? Yes. Um, I don't have a written report because we met at 6 this evening. Um, we um, discussed as we have here at the committee level the water situation and the um, implementation of um, chemical process to um, uh, process the water here, which the committee's familiar with. We um, voted $250,000 to pay the pro project manager the last bill for Royal Steam and uh, the architect and some of the windows, which will be starting soon. And we talked about the control system that probably needs to be updated for the middle school. Um, the school is 20 years old now. Um, we have uh, the similar control system at the high school and at ACES. And the um, project cost is going to be upwards of $150 plus thousand dollars. Uh, so it's something that we will be talking about future. Okay, thank you. Negotiations. Negotiations has upcoming meetings scheduled and we're trying very hard to get a contract settled before the end of the school year. Okay. Academic excellence. Academic excellence met this morning. We received information on Title I and special education work. Upcoming plans for professional development. Um, the air report, which we all received information from Shannon this evening. Uh, turnaround plan for the high school. Partnership with the YMCA for summer school district uh, literacy committee writing portfolio and the math intervention committee. Thank you. Public relations. We did not meet this past month. Policy subcommittee. Policy and up this morning. Um, in your packet, you have the um, adopted uh, policy, the EDH, that was approved last time. Go into your policy book. And uh, we moved several policies forward to the school committee for approval, and but they will not appear until the June meeting. Uh, committee member referrals, we'll start with Deb. Um, okay. Bill? Nothing to add. Joe? Nothing. Ken? No. Yeah. Mitch? Uh, just the, uh, you can uh, help me out. Uh, we mentioned all the uh, things.
things that are coming up, graduation, step-up ceremony, I'm getting uh, calls from people asking me, I'm going to be taking photographs this year, and I want to get the word across that as I told them last year that I stopped doing that. I don't want any parents showing up here expecting that I'm going to do it and find out that they didn't get any shots because they never brought their parents. So we can spread the word, principles, etc. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, as the CPAC liaison, I just want to let you know they did have their meeting last month. Um, Fred was advised uh, the CPAC that they were able to go ahead with their uh, building of the website and advised them not to use <coughs> the ARRC logo. Um, they also have some survey data presentation that they'd like to present, and they will be requesting a meeting with RC to utilize the robocall system to have CPAC uh, notifications go out to parents in the district. Um, other than that, I wanted to say thank you at ARMS. Uh, as a parent at ARMS, I wanted to say thank you for offering the math um, tutoring for the MCAS. It greatly helped one of my daughters, so thank you for putting that on for them. And thank you for recognizing that there are children in the seventh grade who do need additional um, challenges. And they put together a seventh grade seminar that um, is challenging students who are performing on the higher academic scale and giving them an opportunity <coughs> to, to grow and improve. So thank you at ARMS. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Nancy. I'm awesome. Okay. Um, Mitch, were the, were the letters uh, informational just for the committee members? Yes. Uh, okay. Yes, they are. Okay. Uh, Nancy. Oh, okay. Yeah. As far as the uh, financial uh, support letters, I know that uh, they've indicated that if any other school committee members who want to write letters, uh, we certainly can use that support for greater financing for, for education. Okay. And in terms of the, uh, I can also report that in terms of the letter to, uh, to Senator Gobi and uh, to the Chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, uh, as a result of our request, uh, they have filed an amendment asking for the additional $100,000 for that school-based Healthcare that we are Nancy. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Let's move your second. It's crazy on this side of the room. I like to go home. Seeing there's no discussion on that motion, all those in favor? Aye. <laughs>